So, an incredible track record, <laughs> and it's a great honour um, to have, as I say, Susan here tonight, and I'll hand over. Thank you, Alan. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Alan and Richard particularly, and also Tony, who went beyond the call of duty and walked out through the rain to lead us to this place, this wonderful house, which uh, I have sort of before I start a brief anecdote about a similar house that Harvard has acquired, which is um, Philip Johnson's house uh, in Cambridge. Uh, but the problem after they acquired it was they found that the area is only zoned residential and you're not allowed to use it for <laughs> other kinds of functions. So they're still working that out. But since there's considerable antagonism between town and gown, uh, Cambridge isn't rushing to make it possible to use this house. So it's really nice that you have this facility here. Now, tonight I want to talk about words and the words that planners use. In a certain way, the argument I'm making was undermined by last night when I participated in a forum on the plan for Melbourne because everybody actually was using the words equity and justice in this forum. Uh, but it doesn't seem necessarily the case that using those words makes that much difference. Uh, although I would hope that maybe in the long run it does. Uh, my book, The Just City, asked this question. It asked what principles should guide the formulation of plans and their impl implementation based on the principle of justice. I was reacting in many ways to the neoliberal tide that swept over most of the cities of the world, uh, the emphasis on other uh, goals besides justice, the fact that inequality is increasing almost everywhere. Uh, did not, I do not think, uh, and in this respect I differ from many of my friends, uh, that it's realistic to talk about what might be in a context that isn't that of global capitalism. Uh, that uh, capitalism is with us and it's going to be with us for a while. Uh, so the question is what's realistic uh, within particular contexts? Uh, because I think you always have to see planning as context dependent, that you can't simply take practices from one place and plop them down in another. Uh, but given the constraints of locality and also the constraints of globalization, uh, what are the principles that should guide you? Uh, so in my book, and you're all welcome to see how I work this out, I used works of political philosophy from very well-known philosophers uh, to derive three principles that I characterize as the principles of justice, which are equity, democracy, and diversity. Uh, I distinguish the just city from the good city. I'm not as ambitious to, as to tell you what the good city should be. Uh, and in fact, I, some of the reviews that, of my book have criticized me for limiting myself to justice, but I think justice is a, in itself a worthy enough goal. Now, uh, when you are in planning circles, if you're working for city government, actually the term justice isn't used that much. It may have been used last night in the forum at the university, but these are the kinds of terms uh, that are most typically used. We have to make our city sustainable. We have to make it competitive. Uh, sustainability uh, as a term is now being uh, displaced by resilience, which is the term du jour. Uh, creativity was, maybe that's fading a little, I don't know, but Richard Florida has gone around the world telling everybody that cities need to be creative in order to grow. So we've moved from an emphasis on building office buildings to building artists' uh, lofts and, uh, and encouraging the creative class to come to the city. Uh, participation and collaboration were the terms that were most pressed by those people who considered themselves progressive. Uh, more than equity, that these are process terms, participation and collaboration. Uh, they tend to assume that if you have participation, uh, that uh, the results will be equitable, but I think that's often not the case. Uh, collaboration implies that there aren't real conflicts of interest, that we can have everybody just getting along. Uh, so the issue to me in terms of the language that planners use is whether these common terms don't obfuscate the trade-offs uh, between different values, whether or not they in fact cover over injustice 
with innocuous labels. What I'm going to talk about very briefly are some theories of power. Uh, then use resilience planning, which is, as I said, very au courant, uh, to talk about how words matter. Then give some examples from New York City and, uh, and Singapore. I've been teaching in Singapore every year for the last three years, and I'm going again there this spring. Singapore is interesting because uh, if you're concerned with, on the one hand, process, and on the other hand, outcomes, Singapore has some really good outcomes. Many of us, I think, would disapprove of the process. <laughs> uh, so uh, when you're concerned with planning and how it should be conducted, in fact, you have to be concerned with both, with both process and outcomes. Uh, then I'm going to conclude by talking about the rhetoric of planning. So, uh, if you're going to talk about the theories that underlie uh, participatory planning, uh, that uh, if you read the literature in political philosophy, uh, among political scientists, the term deliberative democracy is very much around. That uh, what you're supposed to do is, and it derives from the works of, of Jürgen Habermas primarily, uh, is to get everybody in a room or around a table or someplace and have them deliberate with each other and the result of deliberation should be greater rationality. That's Habermas's real argument is that rationality comes through discussion, through argument. Uh, it isn't simply a technocratic thing that comes down from above. And so uh, within the context of planning, the argument about deliberative democracy is a reformist one. It says that planners of old, the ones who perpetrated urban renewal and swept everyone away, uh, were ones who simply had these dicta that came down. So instead what we should have is the involvement of the people who are, and the term that's beloved of course is stakeholder. Uh, so we should have stakeholders deliberating with each other. Uh, there are real problems with the argument for deliberative democracy because it tends to assume that all these stakeholders have equal resources and equal power when they're deliberating with each other. Uh, pluralism uh, is the term that when I was in graduate school was most used for the view that um, every society, every city was made up of a bunch of interest groups, that the outcome in terms of policy came from the kind of pulling and hauling uh, among these different groups. Uh, pluralism as a um, description of what goes on has been replaced by what's come to be called complexity theory. Uh, in complexity theory, we just have so many variables and they're all interacting all the time, so nobody's in charge uh, is the basic argument. Uh, then in order to find out what's going on, what you have is big, what's come to be known as big data. So basically you have a lot of data uh, which can be, if you're in transportation planning, origin and destination data. If you're in economic development planning, it's all the unemployment rate and the stock market levels and a zillion things. And then you build models and uh, you attempt through these models to make some predictions. Uh, but the whole substructure of complexity theory is that nobody really can control very much. Uh, so what these theories tend to overlook is what you might call the Marxist insight. That is that the system is in fact structured. Uh, that social relationships are formed and reproduced not just by the random interaction of variables, but in fact by an underlying economic and social structure. Now you don't have to be a Marxist reductionist and say the economic system is the only thing structuring the system, but neither can you say that it isn't structuring what's going on, uh, that there are winners and losers, uh, that those people who have more economic resources are much more likely to be winners, uh, that uh, globalization uh, is, which so affects, in fact, urban development, that globalization is a process that is largely being imposed by uh, the owners of global capital. So then to move to resilience and to talk about the vocabulary that's being used uh, at present, uh, that um, resilience is a term that's really come to the fore in part in reaction to in the United States, the hurricanes, uh, in Australia, the fires, uh, but also to what you people 
called the, I keep forgetting your acronym, the GEC, is that it? GFC. GFC, the Global Financial Crisis, <laughs> right. We call it in the United States the Great Recession, and so the uh, GFC was a new term to me, but anyhow. So uh, the term resilience is stretched to encompass economic crisis, uh, um, crisis of natural resource depletion, crisis of global climate change, crisis of uh, flood, of fire, etc. cetera. Uh, so then what do you do if you're a big data person? Well, you take all of whatever factors might cause fires or might cause flooding or might cause economic disaster and you run them through uh, some kind of model that you have developed and you make a calculation of risk. Then presumably if you're a planner, what you do is based on your calculation of risk, uh, you plan uh, to respond to that risk. Uh, but there's a, there are questions that underlie risk assessment. A uh, risk assessment uses basically a formula to find out what the probability of an event occurring is. Uh, but what it doesn't tell you is what level of risk is in fact acceptable. Even if the risk is one in 10 million, if the, 10 million, if the one in 10 million is cataclysmic, uh, well then what, what do you say uh, about it? Uh, one of the things actually in terms of people's perception of risk is it's very media driven so that um, American mothers now are terrified that their children are going to be kidnapped. Uh, where when I was a child, I walked to school, everybody walked to school when I was a child. No one now walks to school. You can't live a block from school without having to be escorted to school because people perceive the risk of child molestation, children being taken away as being so high, which is because whenever a kid is kidnapped, of course it's usually by uh, an estranged parent, but whenever such a thing happens, uh, it's so publicized uh, that people see it as happening all the time. Uh, we have 24-hour news cycles now, and it's very, un the news when nothing's happening is extremely uninteresting. Uh, so that, of course, they feature what is most terrifying to people. Uh, so that uh, what is most terrifying to people uh, is constantly being repeated and reiterated, uh, and thus people think, well, Americans think that Obamacare is going to bring down the American economy. In fact, if you read the quotations about it uh, in the New York Times, all these ordinary people are saying, we can't allow it to be implemented uh, because it will ruin the economy. Well, what the linkage is, is not clear, but if you watch Fox News, which you people have brought us, that is Rupert Murdoch <laughs> has brought us, uh, that uh, Fox News tells you all day long that this is going to ruin the American economy. Uh, so uh, not only is there a question of what level of risk is tolerable, but what kind of risk uh, is tolerable. Now, what risk analysis does is it provides very precise numbers. It says, well, the probability of something happening is 0.2876. They like to take it to a bunch of decimal points. Uh, but uh, in a, there was a special issue or a section of the journal Planning Theory and Practice on the subject of resilience. Uh, and I like this quote, which says that the clearest message from the changing evidence base over the last decade concerns the danger of false precision. With regard to flooding, the data appear to be particularly subject to rapid and fundamental change. So we see very precise numbers developed out of these enormously complex models, but the numbers are all built on assumptions, which if you change the assumptions, the numbers all change too. David Harvey, who I assume some of you are familiar with or, and others are not, uh, David Harvey is a very famous urban geographer who teaches now at the City University of New York. He's in his 80s. He's been, he's probably the last unabashed Marxism in social, Marxist in social science. Uh, he makes, <laughs> oh, there are others, okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, but at any rate, he states that the discourse of scientific rationalism and risk assessment is very much 
part of the discourse of scientific rationalism disguises the question of the relationship between humans and nature as a technical discourse concerning the proper allocation of scarce resources for the benefit of human welfare. That is, we're all in it together and the reason that we aren't able to deal with all these environmental threats is simply because we don't know enough. It's a technical deficiency. It's an informational deficiency. It's not a result of rapacious capitalists. It's simply because we don't know enough to know how to control the danger of flooded fire, etc. cetera. Uh, so after I pulled that quote out, then I uh, noticed a recent RFT, RFP from the Rockefeller Foundation uh, which says public and private sector urban leaders have neither the technical expertise nor the financial resources to create and execute resilient strategies that address the need of the poor or vulnerable people. So it turns out that we aren't taking care of the poor not because there's any class interest in conflict, uh, but rather because we just don't have the resources and we don't have the technical knowledge. And if we only have the technical knowledge and the resources, then there just wouldn't be the problem that poor people live on low land that gets flooded and rich people live on high land that doesn't. Harvey goes on to talk about what he calls the ecological modernization movement, which is basically the kinds of policies which deal with environmental threat, which deal with climate change, without in fact goring anyone's ox. So he says that the ecological modernization movement is co-optive as it attempts to gain consensual policies. The effort to gain consensus about how to be resilient basically means promoting programs which uh, both are profitable and ecologically good. So green industries, for example, are being sold everywhere as a way of both making money and improving the environment. Uh, but what this approach means is that programs that aren't profitable or protective of private property rights will be neglected, even if such programs might be much more efficient uh, in terms, in fact, of dealing with climate change. So rather than regulating, we should try to let Shell Oil or whatever find some way of making money off of being less uh, polluting. Uh, Harvey argues that instead priority should be given to environmental justice. He argues that the environmental justice movement makes protection of the most vulnerable of the first priority. So it's quite different if you're saying, well, we have to figure out some policy uh, for climate change, uh, which uh, will allow uh, capitalist firms to make money, or we have to find some policy for climate change, which will, first of all, protect those people who would be most affected by rising sea levels, for example. And these are different uh, approaches uh, to the issue and don't necessarily produce uh, the same kinds of policies. Now one of the recently proposed ways, or not so recently as I will say, uh, but at any rate what's become quite popular now and originated, the term originated in the Netherlands, uh, is that we should make room for water. The Netherlands, as you all know, has invested huge amounts of money since the 17th century, really, uh, in, in fact, even before that, in fending off the waters, uh, in building enormous kinds of dams, of dikes, of, uh, of basically taking the Zuider Zee and making it into a lake, of uh, doing everything to keep the water out. Uh, but currently now there's what they see as a more progressive approach uh, which is making room for water that is allowing flooding uh, so as to uh, absorb uh, the water rather than simply uh, leave, try to keep it out and end up with it overtopping uh, the dams. Uh, but the question is if you're making room for water, it's one thing if you're saying, okay, we'll flood some polders somewhere where nobody is, or even there, uh, there are farmers who are there who are gonna lose their land. Uh, but when we're talking about metropolitan areas and making room for water, then the question becomes exactly whose properties are going to be flooded. Now what happened in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina is the president of the American Planning Association and various colleagues all went down there uh, to give advice immediately after the hurricane on how they should deal with the future. 
So they came up with a map which came to be known as the Green Dot Map of New Orleans, in which they took areas and said, we're going to make room for water in these areas, that is, we're going to not rebuild, we're going to allow them uh, to absorb, to sponge up uh, the next uh, hurricane. Well, what a surprise, the areas all turned out to be, the Green Dots were all placed on low-income African-American areas. Uh, and one of the areas which in fact was also flooded, an upper middle class area after the hurricane, they uh, was to be rebuilt. Uh, so this green dot map, as it, as it was called, because these areas on the map had these green dots because they were going to be green spaces, uh, caused such a furor that they all backed away from it uh, and uh, instead uh, said, okay, if you want to rebuild your community, you can rebuild your community. Now the hurricane was used also, and here uh, they really went and did it, it was used as a rationale for demolishing all the public housing in New Orleans. Uh, so uh, the public housing in New Orleans has been replaced to the extent it's been replaced uh, with mixed income housing, which means that something like 10% of the people who originally lived in it uh, can move back into the areas in which they were. Uh, and it said that, well, you know, this is what's wonderful because we got rid of all these problem places. Uh, so it's rationalized very strongly as good planning doctrine because what we believe in is mixed income and that uh, we are opposed to concentrated poverty. And so the way of getting rid of concentrated poverty is to get rid of the people who were concentrated there, uh, which was also, of course, the rationale for urban renewal. So they conveniently had this hurricane. Uh, as a rationale for bringing back uh, the old urban renewal program. Now what would be a more just approach uh, to dealing with the aftermath of a hurricane in New Orleans? And New Orleans is a poor city and a mostly black city. Uh, well, it would be what um, in Singapore is called en bloc uh, removal. That is, if you have people in a building in public housing, you build another building somewhere and then you move them there all together all at once. Uh, if they want to go, at any rate. Uh, and reconstruction of community, but not reconstruction in necessarily the same place it was. That is, it's one thing to say we're going to not rebuild the Lower Ninth Ward, uh, but it's another thing to say we're going to build them new places to live somewhere else, uh, which nobody seemed to seriously propose uh, in New Orleans. So what happened in New Orleans was they, just, they believed in participation. So they said that uh, each neighborhood was free to determine its own fate. Uh, there's a famous expression from Anatole France, I think, anyhow, a French expression which says the rich and poor are equally free to live under bridges. Uh, well, likewise, all the neighborhoods in New Orleans were equally free to rebuild or not. Uh, so the middle class neighborhoods rebuilt and the Lower Ninth Ward is pretty much in the same state as it was. So saying that, well, we're going to have participation and each neighborhood that can mobilize itself is welcome to do so, essentially privileges those with more resources. The term resilience itself typically is defined as a return to normality, although the people who write about it uh, and the term, and, and Holling, who was the one who wrote the original piece about resilience, say that no, it, it isn't simply going back to what was before, but it's in fact adaptation. Uh, so uh, uh, resilience as a term would argue that what we need to do is adapt to, you might say, the new normal, uh, which is climate change, hurricanes, fires, what have you. Uh, but the way in which it's done tends to be in the interest of property owners. Uh, what appears normal to people produces security for many, uh, but only because the insecurity of the most vulnerable is overlooked. Uh, that um, the people who are the best participators are the people who have the most skills in participation. In a more just system, vulnerable groups would be not only given priority, but also given resources. So a resilience plan then that's based on a concept of urban justice would identify the most vulnerable populations, would look at the various alternatives that would protect them in the event of various kinds of environmental uh, threats. 
uh, if in fact uh, they're going to they do suffer from it, uh, they, if they lost their livelihood, then they would be compensated for it. Uh, in uh, New York, after, you know, I was thinking, um, because Mary earlier mentioned 9-11, uh, we, we say 9-11, but of course you'd all say 11-9, because it's only in the United States that the month is, pre is, before, the, is before the date, which is a little confusing for Americans. But at any rate, uh, when the Twin Towers went down, among the people who were most devastated were the workers in the restaurants on top of, uh, at the top of the tower, windows on the world. But of course, in the compensation for victims, it was calculated as such compensation always is on your future earnings. So uh, although there was a floor so that the families of the uh, windows on the world workers did receive more compensation than would be just the case based on their earnings, the people who were working for the brokerage firms and the financial firms and buildings got much, much more uh, than the people who were the dishwashers and the wait staff uh, in Windows on the World. Uh, so uh, compensation, well, in compensation if you lose your house in the hurricane, uh, that compensation isn't for what you would get in order to buy a new house. It would simply be based on the market value of your old house. Uh, so that uh, if you were poor to begin with, and you lost the house that you actually owned, uh, it's very likely that you wouldn't, with the compensation you got, even if you were insured, uh, be able to buy another house. And in fact, uh, that's what happened to many of the low-income homeowners in New Orleans. Uh, the people who, because of unemployment in the uh, GFC, I keep trying to remember those initials, uh, in the GFC and had their mortgages uh, taken uh, in foreclosure, have their houses taken in foreclosure, uh, they're just out of luck, and that's the way it goes. Uh, so that in response to financial crisis, we saved the banks and the financial institutions on the grounds that uh, the whole world economy would collapse if that weren't done, uh, but saving the homes of lower income people uh, was not done. And in fact, um, uh, what we had were massive waves of defaults of the United States, in Ireland too, actually. Uh, and then the speculators who bought up all these houses uh, after they were taken by the mortgagers. Uh, now, uh, New York has recently come up with a plan uh, called a Stronger, More Resilient New York. And I'll talk about that a little. Uh, New York is one of the examples I use in my book of, uh, exam of attempting to say how it stacks up in terms of the criteria of a just city of equity, diversity, and democracy. Now, New York has a lot of democracy. It has very high levels of participation, of civic organization, of all kinds of different organizations and interests uh, which express themselves vociferously. So there's certainly pluralism, there's certainly contestation, uh, but the results aren't necessarily, are certainly not consensual, and are not necessarily democratic. Uh, New York ranks highly in terms of diversity. Uh, that is, if I'm examining the quality of outcomes in New York, uh, it is a very diverse city, nearly 40% of New Yorkers are foreign born. It now has the largest population in its history, uh, but it's really weak in terms of equity. Now compared to the rest of the United States, New York has a substantial amount of public housing. Something like a million people live in public housing and subsidized units compared to the rest of the United States. Uh, so 17% of rental units in New York are affordable by however you um, define that, uh, but uh, compared to Europe, most European cities or to Singapore, uh, it's a much smaller proportion. Um, moreover, no new public housing is being built. Uh, there's a major emphasis instead on mega projects and also on sports venues, which are somehow supposed to, by giving the New York Yankees a new stadium and the New York Mets a new stadium uh, and the uh, 
basketball team in Brooklyn, a new arena, and all of these very heavily subsidized, that all New Yorkers are supposed to um, benefit from that. Thank you. So the mayor came out with this plan called a stronger, more resilient New York. Now, if it had come out five years ago, it would have been a more sustainable New York, but resilient is now the term uh, that he uses. And among, now many of the things in it are just fine. I don't want to criticize them. And certain easy things to do, like building shutters over the subway station so that the water, when there's flooding, doesn't pour down them, uh, seems like a, a non-controversial thing to do. But he has one really big mega project proposal in it, which is that, uh, as you may know, during the uh, Hurricane Sandy, Lower Manhattan was totally flooded and Wall Street was flooded. And many of the, some of these buildings are still not open for business. Uh, so his idea is to use landfill, which probably one can't really be allowed now, but it was, it's in there, to do, build a giant landfill buffer on the east side of Manhattan Island uh, and, on t and pay for it by building a giant mega project of luxury apartments and office buildings, et cetera. Uh, so rather than concerning himself really with the poor people who live out at the edge of Brooklyn. Uh, the idea is that we had better protect Wall Street. It's our most important asset. And how do we protect Wall Street? We build more Wall Street. <laughs> uh, in an interview that got <laughs> quite notorious uh, in um, New York Magazine, he said, wouldn't it be great if we could get all the Russian billionaires to move here? Now, this was prompted by uh, we have a mayoral election right now, and Bill de Blasio, who's the Democratic candidate, uh, basically said that Bloomberg was the mayor for the rich, and that uh, uh, New York is a tale of two cities, and that we have, in fact, class warfare in New York. Uh, and that uh, uh, one of the, this new arena in Brooklyn for the New York, for the Brooklyn Nets, uh, the biggest uh, fin financer of it was this guy Prokhorov, who's uh, one of the Russian billionaires, who likes basketball, and it's rather a peculiar thing, but at any rate, he paid uh, f to buy the team, but the city has really paid uh, to subsidize the arena, paid very heavily for it. Uh, so, um, so Bloomberg was criticized for catering to this Russian billionaire. And he said, if we can find a bunch of billionaires around the world to move here, that would be a godsend, because that's where the revenue comes to take care of everybody else. So it's a picture of trickle down. If we can only get enough really rich people, uh, that somehow the poor will be taken care of. Uh, he also says, the way to help those who are less fortunate is number one, to attract more very fortunate people. They are the ones that pay the bills. The people that would get very badly hurt here if you drive out the very wealthy are the people he, that is de Blasio, professes to try to help. This city is not two groups, and if to some extent it is, it's one group paying for the services for the other. So it turns out uh, in this picture of New York City, that we all have to be grateful to the wealthy because it's their expenditures which are letting the less rest of us survive. And therefore, planning policy should be devoted to getting more of these kinds of people, rather than starting out with the people who, in fact, are disadvantaged and improving their situation. Uh, and to give you a feel for the contrast that one sees in New York, uh, this is public housing in Coney Island. Uh, Coney Island did get flooded during the hurricane, and uh, these buildings were, of course, fairly seriously affected. And you can see what they look like, which actually is not so different from how quite a bit of the public housing in Melbourne looks. And here is the recently completed, well, it's now nine years, Columbus Center. Uh, on Columbus Circle in Manhattan, where the bottom floors, uh, this part, there's a pointer on here, uh, the bottom floors of uh, a very upscale shopping mall and then the most expensive restaurants in the city. Uh, the next 
floors, and then on the top floor of that front part uh, is Jazz at Lincoln Center, which is very nice for those of us who can afford tickets to Jazz at Lincoln Center. And then above it are office towers and condos and the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. Uh, this, of course, uh, this land was owned by the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority. That is, it's public land, and this was built uh, entirely for the wealthy. Uh, and it fits into the general argument that says if we can only provide enough places for the wealthy, everybody else will benefit. Now, one of the problems, and you have it here, it's been pointed out to me by many people, is most of these apartments are vacant most of the time, and wherever they're spending their money, it's probably not in New York, because they're keeping these apartments as, uh, as safety nets for themselves for when whatever country they're living in might undergo a revolution or want to confiscate their money or whatever. Uh, the, you know, or they could be here a couple of months a year to go shopping or whatever. Uh, but that we have this massive construction, uh, very expensive, and we're talking some of them are $90 million condos in New York uh, for people who are, many of them, foreigners and don't actually live in them. Now this enterprise, which um, the city has subsidized, uh, the calculation is something like $400 million of public subsidy went into the building of the new Yankee Stadium. Now why did we have to do that? Uh, there was always the vague threat that the Yankees would move somewhere else, but the Yankees were never going to move somewhere else because the Yankees are the richest team in baseball because they have the biggest media market in baseball. So the Yankees paid for the stadium, and they'll tell you that they paid for the stadium, but their payment in lieu of taxes goes to pay off the loan that paid for the stadium. So they basically don't pay any taxes, they simply service the loan that they got. Uh, then the, because they built the new stadium on top of a public park, and the law in New York State says that if you take away a public park, you have to provide an equal amount of land. The city spent a couple of hundred million dollars providing an equal amount of land and building new parks. Uh, then the Tr Metropolitan Transportation Authority built a whole new station to serve the stadium. So, and then, of course, everybody around it was supposed to benefit because all these people would be coming there. But what they did was they internalized almost everything in the stadium, so it has lots of restaurants. Uh, lots of bars and nobody goes anywhere but either they take the train and go directly in the stadium or they park and go directly in the stadium and then they go home. So people who own souvenir stores and uh, restaurants and bars near it find that they do much less business than they did with the old Yankee Stadium. Uh, but this is justified in that the Bronx is the poorest part of Manhattan, of New York, and therefore by subsidizing this enterprise, uh, we are doing something for Bronx. Moreover, the Yankees, of course, have huge revenue from uh, media, from television, and none of that goes to the city. So basically, uh, the richest team in baseball got this enormous subsidy in order to have this grand new stadium with the kind of skyboxes that corporate elites fancy sitting in. So this is all part of making a more resilient New York that can bounce back after financial crises. Now this is one of the really better things that was done by the Bloomberg administration, the High Line, uh, which is this uh, landscape walkway on an old railroad line. Uh, to Bloomberg's credit, uh, he had this Parks Department invest in it because his predecessor, Rudy Giuliani, wanted to tear it down. Uh, but it reflects the way in which the parks in Manhattan get a lot more resources and are a whole lot better than the parks in the rest of the city. Now, uh, there's the Friends of the High Line, which, I, in fact, I'm a member of, and the Central Park Conservancy. And these are all public-private partnerships which subsidize the amenities in areas where well-to-do people live, uh, but uh, there are no, s so the argument that the city makes is, oh, it isn't that we put more public resources into uh, the rich parts of the city, it's that the rich people who live in the rich parts of the city put their own resources into it. But of course, this doesn't, despite what Bloomberg's argument that everything trickles down and trickles out, it doesn't. Uh, New York, however, is very diverse, and that's one place where there's a very high level, I think, of tolerance of 
difference. Not to say that there isn't racism and ethnic antagonism, but by and large we really see an enormous amount of mixture and particularly Queens uh, must be one of the most diverse places on earth. Now the case I use as contrast is Singapore, which I've gotten to know from spending uh, a couple of months there every year. And Singapore, as I said to begin with, doesn't emphasize political process very much, although it's certainly becoming more democratic than it used to be. Uh, but uh, it has outcomes uh, which in many ways are more favorable uh, to low-income people, or at least low-income citizens and permanent residents than is the case in New York. So Lee Kuan Yew, the founding father of Singapore, said, and, and he was very influenced by Henry George and his concept of the unearned increment. He said, I saw no reason why private landowners should profit from an increase in land value brought about by economic development and the infrastructure paid for with public funds. So this is so contrary to the view in New York where the idea is that you improve amenities just so private, pe private developers can in fact benefit from uh, the externalities of public investment. Here it's that we in fact confiscate that unearned increment. And Singapore does not have speculative real estate development. Oops. Uh, so this is a picture, for those of you who heard Norman's talk uh, this afternoon, of um, older public housing, which is in the middle there, and uh, the new public housing, which are these towers called the Pinnacle, uh, historic preservation and the shop houses there, and over there the kind of shopping mall that is very prevalent in Asian cities. Uh, but what's interesting about the Pinnacle is they made this decision in the Housing and Development Board that said, we're going to keep public housing so nice uh, that people will want to live in it, including people who are upper middle class. So the income ceiling is quite high. It's only the very well-to-do who don't qualify uh, to live in public housing. It's not stigmatized. It's considered desirable. 85% of the citizen population. Uh, lives in it. Uh, so Singapore's orientation towards outcome rather than process uh, retains the goal of keeping the great majority in the public housing sector uh, and of constantly raising the standard uh, which public housing is built. So the pinnacle resembles the high-end condominiums. In fact, there's no particularly nicer private condominium really than it is. Uh, but uh, for the older public housing, which is deteriorated and which was built much more cheaply at the beginning, uh, they're tearing it down and rebuilding, but they take everybody on block, move them to another building, essentially to swing space, or they build another building and move them there and then tear down the building. It isn't the American system where we tear everything down and say, well, in eight years or something, if you're lucky, uh, you can come back. Uh, it captures the, pub the increment. It captures for the public much of the increments and in the value of land. Uh, the ethnic integration policy, which anybody else finds rather odd or peculiar, requires that each HDB structure, each public housing building, have uh, its inhabitants in proportion to the ethnicity of the population at large. It's about 70% Chinese, 13% uh, Malay, 7% Indian, and whatever else is left. Uh, now in the United States there's been this enormous debate as to whether Areas of concentrated poverty are the cause of poverty. That is, it's a kind of uh, ecological argument that says people are poor because of where they live. And if they only lived in somewhere nicer, they would get better. This has been around for, I think, since the 19th century, this argument that uh, slums cause poverty rather than poverty causing slums. Uh, so uh, planners uh, then have become very involved in moving the poor out and dispersing them. And there have been these programs of um, called moving for opportunity, moving to opportunity, uh, hope six ones of trying to disperse the poor, uh, but it's the poor who bear the burden of being dispersed. 
We also, of course, get mixed income when we have gentrification, at least for a while. But in neither the case of dispersal nor of gentrification can one actually find very clear advantages uh, for low-income people. Uh, all the research has really shown that those who actually moved out because a lot of them didn't move out, they just moved to other low-income areas. But those who moved out to more middle-class areas, uh, the major benefit they saw was greater security. Uh, but they did not find that educational levels rose or employment levels rose or income rose. And they found actually that many people moved back because they lost their social networks. Now, Patsy Healy, who is a person whose work I like a great deal, a British planning theorist, uh, says that social justice meant a concern not only with the justice of material outcomes, but also with the processes through which policies are articulated and implemented. So the question is, okay, we can look at Singapore and say they've really done a great job of planning. They really have wonderful public housing. Uh, they are very outcomes oriented. The government isn't corrupt. They do plan. They plan very intelligently and rationally. Uh, it is a meritocratic system whereby the people who are at the top tend to be people who are very competent and astute. Uh, but they're, you know, it's not a very democratic system. I wouldn't say it's anywhere near the worst in the world. In fact, uh, uh, there are fair elections. Uh, the opposition party occasionally wins a seat in the parliament. Uh, when they won six seats, there was such a furor that they immediately started making more concessions to everyone because they were so upset. Uh, by and large, the government has a great deal of legitimacy. Uh, but uh, there certainly, and there's more participation because they've set up consuls, housing consuls within the HDB housing. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, although in the university I'm free to say whatever I want, I'm not free to stand on a street corner and say whatever I want. So there are real limits on free speech. Uh, the media, the television is completely under the government's thumb. On the other hand, uh, the internet is completely open. You can say anything you want. Uh, so it's an uneven system. Uh, the question then for people thinking about how planning should be conducted is what weight to be placed on process versus what weight to be placed on outcomes. Uh, that it, Singapore could use more democracy and the United States and much of Europe now uh, could use a whole lot more emphasis on redistribution, on equity, on more just outcomes. So I conclude by saying that in the United States there's too much process emphasis. We have plenty of participation, uh, which means that these Tea Party people have managed to capture all kinds of, uh, of places uh, because they're well mobilized. Uh, and uh, in Singapore there is, in fact, too little. I think uh, that when we're thinking about urban planning, planning at the metropolitan air level, that there are real limits on what you can do, uh, that uh, much depends on resources coming out of the national government. Uh, but we can at least refrain from doing really bad things. Uh, planners have a bad reputation in many places because uh, what they did was displace people involuntarily, uh, destroyed communities, and I, I just can't see any reason why huge amounts of public money should go to support rich sports teams, uh, which in fact offer few general benefits, uh, but they have you know, strong supporters in the public uh, who care a lot about sports. Uh, at the local level, that planning can lead to policies that foster more equitable distribution of government revenues. More resources could be put in the parks in the poorer areas and less in the parks uh, in the more well-to-do areas. Uh, that uh, there are groups that are excluded from uh, policy making. So if the discourse surrounding policy making focuses on the justice of the decision rather than simply its contribution to competitiveness, to creative cities, to uh, winning the race, uh, there's a tendency to think of cities when you're talking about them relative to other cities as unitary wholes, as entities which are in some competition. So it's Hong Kong versus New York. Uh, there's a new plan for rezoning Midtown East in Manhattan, uh, which Bloomberg, 
to make it uh, to allow for larger buildings because Bloomberg says we have to compete with Singapore, we have to compete with London, uh, so that an area which is already overburdened uh, in terms of its transit, in terms of its sidewalks, in terms of almost everything, that we should still have bigger buildings because that's what corporations want. Uh, so if the discourse surrounded uh, justice rather than competitiveness, I think a lot would be accomplished. Uh, that the language you use as planners uh, is surely connected to outcomes. Uh, and it is, in fact, the substantive content of what is being proposed, not simply whether you have a participatory process or not, uh, that matters if justice is to be the outcome. So thank you.